And now, with today's message, here's Ed Stevens. It'll be on the topic of redating the epistle of Barnabas. And you may wonder, what in the world is that all about? Well, let me explain that. Uh, critics of preterism use the apostolic father writings, such as the epistle of Barnabas, uh, to prove that the parousia, resurrection, and judgment could not have happened in AD 70 because all of these apostolic father writings, which were supposedly written in the first generation after AD 70, were still teaching a future parousia, resurrection, and judgment. Now you see the point there. Uh, the critics of preterism used these apostolic father writings, which were supposedly written after 70 AD, still teaching a future parousia, to prove that the, that the preterist view cannot be right, because the Christian writers after 70 AD are still looking forward to a future parousia. Huh. That sounds like a good argument, uh, but I think we're going to be able to challenge it successfully. And my master's thesis will be the first shot across the bow in that regard. Uh, based on the methodology and suggestions of John A.T. Robinson in his book, Redating the New Testament, I decided to see how far we could go in redating the Apostolic Father writings before 70 A.D. as well. And the perfect test case for this would be the Epistle of Barnabas, since everyone in the patristic study field uh, dates Barnabas after 70 A.D. Even most of the preterist uh, scholars that I know uh, who are any, somewhat aware of, of uh, the field of patristic studies, uh, they also tend to date the Epistle of Barnabas after 70 A.D. If it can be dated before 70, then the rest of the Apostolic Fathers might also be redated before 70 because a Barnabas is the one that, that everyone dates after 70, uh, whereas some of the other ones can be and are dated before 70, even by futurist scholars. But if we can date Barnabas before 70, then the rest of them could be easily redated uh, before 70 as well. And that would very effectively rob our critics of some of their most damaging historical arguments against preterism. That is why I decided to do my master's thesis on this very topic, redating the Epistle of Barnabas. Now some of us may be wondering uh, how our critics can legitimately use the uninspired church father writings to attack preterism and how redating them before 80 or 70 would make any significant difference. And, uh, you know, and that, that's in terms of, of, of the fact that, that they're uninspired and therefore not authoritative and should have no significant effect on our views. Uh, unfortunately, um, they do have an effect. And all preterists as well as futurists uh, recognize that what the uninspired writers outside of our New Testament have to say does affect the meaning and intent of our New Testament writings uh, because we oftentimes, too oftentimes, interpret scripture based on what those other writers and history have to say. And so it is important, maybe not essential, but it is a very important argument that we need to keep in mind, uh, which futurists are using against us. We don't use uninspired writings to establish our views, but they do. And we need to keep that in mind as we redate these Apostolic Father writings. And I want to read a few statements here from Dr. Charles Hill. He's one of the major critics of preterism, and he wrote one of the chapters in Matheson's attack book against us. And he's the writer that I'm going to be responding to. And this master's thesis is directly aimed at his critique in Matheson's book. And I want to read a few statements out of his chapter so that you'll see why I'm challenging him and see why we're taking this approach to answer it. Uh, on pages uh, 94 and 95 of Matheson's book in Chuck Hill's chapter, 
He says this, uh, Max King argues, as well he must, for the general unreliability of the church fathers and their untrustworthiness in eschatology in particular. And he cites Irenaeus as his only, only example. Max King is apparently aware that early church history offers little or no support for his understanding of eschatology. Therefore, we find hints in several places in his writings that the New Testament understanding of eschatology was virtually lost after AD 70. Our brief review of early Christian literature in this chapter shows that it must have been lost with breathtaking swiftness and comprehensiveness. But what can account for this sudden disappearance of true Christian eschatology after 70 AD? He says, could the church have missed the eschaton? After just a cursory review of the early non-canonical evidence of Christian eschatology, certain questions inevitably spring to mind. The first is, how could it possibly be that the very people who were taught about the consummation of redemptive history by the apostles and who lived through this consummation missed the great event when it happened? Max King says this soon coming of Christ was not some isolated off-the-beaten-path event. It encompassed all the events in Scripture that were tied to the eschatological coming of the Son of Man, such as the judgment, the end of the world, uh, the new heaven and earth, the resurrection, etc. Max King, pages, uh, page 13 in his uh, The Cross and the Parousia book. And then Charles Hill says, And yet we find no trace of any awareness on the part of the church that these things happened in AD 70. He said, after 70 A.D., there, we find no trace of their awareness that these things had actually happened. Instead, all Christians continued to look for the blessed hope after it had already supposedly come. That the very people who experienced the momentous consummation of God's promises in Christ should not have noticed it when it happened would be cause for the greatest possible astonishment. And then he goes on and says, Could the church have so completely misunderstood the nature of the eschaton? And if it were conceivable that the Christians who lived through the climactic end of the age were by some imponderable set of circumstances so dull as to have missed it, there would still remain other serious complications. We would at least expect that they, as churches trained by the apostles themselves, should have known what kind of events they were looking for. They should at least have known what the resurrection was, what the judgment was, what the end of the age was, and what the new heavens and new earth would be. What then are they doing after AD 70, not only still looking for these events to occur, but believing them to be of a completely different nature than what the apostles had taught them to expect? How is it that Christians, not just in some isolated backwater, but all over the empire, including apostolic churches, expect that the return of Christ will actually be visible to the world as the lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, expecting that the coming resurrection will be a bodily one, that all of humanity will then be judged, individually recompensed and assigned to their eternal lots, that then a new age will dawn in which righteousness dwells. And then Chuck Hill goes on to say, if fulfilled eschatology is true, then indeed Max King's judgment on the early church is more than justified. Truly, there is no light in them. The early church then failed to comprehend even the first principles of the ap apostolic teaching on all the great essentials of eschatology. They failed to grasp the very terms of discourse. Could the apostles have failed so miserably? Are the New Testament scriptures so impenetrable? 
If such a horrendously dismal assessment of the early church could be maintained, it would inevitably carry with it a stinging reproach of the teaching abilities of the apostles, rendering their mission all but an unqualified disaster. Can we really conceive of the apostles and their co-workers such as, as such weak and ineffective teachers that they fail to pass on to the next generation not just the details, but the very core and framework of biblical eschatology, the sum and substance of the gospel? We all know how things that should be at the center can slide off to the periphery. But this is not the case here. We do not even find this understanding of eschatology at the periphery. An early Christian writer who is even aware of a hyperpreterist eschatology in the church has yet to be found. Nobody is insisting that the whole church must have understood Paul. But surely it is not too much to ask that somebody understood him and perpetuated at least the core of his eschatological teaching, or at least the true meaning of his terms of discourse. Or if nobody understood Paul, that somebody understood Peter. Or if even Peter was too hard to comprehend, that somebody understood John or James or Luke or Matthew or the author of Hebrews. Can we really believe that all these New Testament authors were unable to secure the transmission of their basic eschatological teaching to the next generation? leaving these teachings to vanish without a trace. Can we really believe that it remained for someone in the late 19th and 20th century to rediscover the core of New Testament eschatology? Many, I trust, will find that conclusions place too high of a demand on their credulity, especially when to read the New Testament in a way that preserves a more or less traditional futurism makes infinitely better sense of the New Testament historical environment. This is very important for us to, to understand how our critics view the preterist approach to eschatology. And this is where I think he really expresses the, the heart of his criticism and the reason why he finds preterism so difficult to believe. He says, Can so little be made of the great change effected by the eschaton, an extremely negative judgment against the competency of the apostles and the intelligence of those taught by them, throws up a glaring irony. How is the wholesale departure of the church after 70 AD for a alien eschatology conceivable, given that we are talking about the church that itself supposedly experiences the freshness of the arrival of the new age. Max King seems to speak of the eschaton as if all of its great transactions would not really affect any change in individual Christians, but rather would bring about the completion of a status already enjoyed by Christians, a full and sudden revealing of something that had been taking place in Christians since the cross. Uh, this is on pages uh, 60, 639 and 641 in The Cross and the Parousia by Max King. And then Chuck Hill says, I fear that this approach of Max King slights what the New Testament writers say about the great change to be effected at the last day. In 1 Corinthians 13, verse 12, Paul claims that the ignorance that he then experienced would be remedied when the perfect would come. His dim vision would then cease. He would then understand fully, even as I have been fully understood. Where then is that perfection of knowledge that Paul so earnestly expected at the arrival of the perfect in 70 AD? How paradoxical it is that the very generation which attained this consummate fullness of knowledge when the perfect came, saw that knowledge evaporate virtually overnight after 70 AD. How utterly unimaginable it is 
Chuck Hill says, that those who became like him when he appeared, for they saw him as he was, not only did not recall the experience for us, but apparently were no different for it. Or rather, the only observable change is that their spiritual understanding was plunged suddenly into the abyss from which it has yet to be recovered. When Paul says that the night is far spent and the day is at hand, Romans 13, verses 11 through 12, Max King explains that the night time was still lingering in the apostolic age and that the daytime is the era of Christianity after 70 AD. Yet according to King, the church has been off base ever since the day arrived. Surely we were much better off during the last watch of the night, when at least we had the living apostolic word. This irony is astounding, he says. This darkness of understanding struck the church, according to hyperpreterism, concurrently with the church's attainment of its ultimate state of perfection. It does not seem to me that one can have it both ways. If one wants to argue for a radical nosedive of the church as soon as the apostles left the scene somewhere around AD 70, then I do not see how one can argue that it was precisely then that the church also attained the consummation of its hope, its full measure of knowledge and sanctification, and its final state of conformity to the image of Christ. He goes on, If all the Christians implicitly understood the terms of Paul's discourse during his ministry, including his cryptic usages of such expressions as the creation in Romans 8, verses 19-22, and the elect in 2 Timothy 2, verse 10, which are said to refer to Israel, and if right up until the end Christians were looking for Jerusalem to be destroyed as the fulfillment of the eschaton, then how can it be that all this changes as soon as we hear from any Christian sources after AD 70? I do not see how one can have it both ways. If the vocabulary of the common apostolic eschatological teaching before AD 70 was generally understood, then the wholesale departure of the entire early church after 70 AD for another understanding cannot be accounted for. Or if it was not understood, then the apostles' abilities as teachers must be called into question. And Max King's argument for a clear and obvious hyperpreterism before AD 70 falls to the ground. If the apostles' own hearers did not understand them, how can we be expected to understand them? And finally he says, The hyperpreterist may try to make peace with the discomforting anomalies of history by viewing them as an indication of the abysmally low level of spiritual apprehension in the post-apostolic age after 70 AD. But then this conclusion will belie his other contention, that his view would have been the same one preached universally by the apostles and received by the congregations they founded before 70 AD. If this claims to be the faith, and he's saying here that, that if preterism is the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints, Jude verse 3, we have to conclude that the delivery was never quite made. Somebody, no, everybody, fumbled the faith away in 70 AD. In addition, the hyperpreterist will then have the troubling paradox to deal with, which is that the generation which experienced God's final perfecting of his saints is the very generation which let the faith slip through its hands. Some of us listening to uh, this theological jargon of Chuck Hill uh, probably got lost in the jungle uh, a little bit. So I want to summarize uh, his main arguments here and then offer uh, what I believe to be a, a good solution to that. Hill points out, that there is not a single Christian writer for at least two centuries after AD 70 who claim 
that the big three eschatological events, the parousia, resurrection, and judgment, all three occurred in AD 70. Not even the heretical writers on the fringe of Christianity recognized the fulfillment of these three events and reported it. Furthermore, every single Christian writer for at least two centuries after 70 AD who mentions the big three events say that those events are still future. Now that's the big two points that I think uh, we don't want to miss when we look at what Chuck Hill is saying. Okay, now Max King claims that the saints before 70 understood the nature of fulfillment correctly and knew what kind of events to look for. When those big three events occurred, they should have been able to recognize it and know that they occurred. However, the saints after AD 70 seemed totally unaware of the fulfillment, and not a single one of them was teaching the spiritualized concept that Max King says they all understood before 70 AD. It appears that the clear understanding that they supposedly had before 70 was gone with the wind after 70 AD. How can that be? How did they so suddenly and completely lose all understanding of the nature of fulfillment? and all awareness that the big three events had already occurred. If they actually did have a correct understanding of the nature of fulfillment before 70 AD, as Max King claims, how in the world could they so suddenly and completely lose that understanding after 70 AD? Now that's one of the big points I think that Chuck Hill tries to get across here. Okay, and then next Chuck Hill says, how can it be that the pre-70 saints understood this perfectly beforehand, as Max King alleges, but missed it when it actually occurred. Whose fault was it that they missed it? The Holy Spirit? Or the Apostles? Or did they simply not understand the nature of fulfillment at all and missed it because it was not what they were expecting to happen? Their ignorance and confusion after AD 70 has serious implications for their understanding and expectations before 70 AD. And that's another point I think that we need to really burn into our memory here and understand clearly because uh, it's a real big issue for futurist critics of our preterist view. Well, this uh, ignorance and confusion after 70 AD implies that all those pre-70 Christians who lived through the big three events of 70 AD and remained alive on earth afterwards were totally unaware of the fulfillment. They completely missed the fulfillment at AD 70, even though they were expecting to see here and experience a great relief and rescue and reward that had been promised to them. Did they experience those things, or were their expectations left unfulfilled? And they kept quiet about it after AD 70 because of their embarrassment over the non-experience of their expected relief, rescue, and reward. Did they actually receive that relief, rescue, and reward, but simply not know that they did? That would mean that their expectations were wrong. Who gave those expectations to them? What does that imply about the teaching of the inspired apostles and even Jesus himself if they were wrong on those expectations? Now we see why the skeptic and the atheist are so quick to reject the inspiration and inerrancy of Scripture. If any of those pre-70 saints were still around after AD 70, why didn't they know about the occurrence of the big three events? and acknowledge that they had occurred, and speak up and set the record straight when their fellow Christians started saying that the big three events are still future. This is a problem. I think uh, not very many of us preterists have taken this into uh, serious consideration. Why didn't they teach the way more accurately to those post-70 Christians who were teaching a totally different nature of fulfillment for the big three events than what the apostles had taught the pre-70 saints. They were silent 
on both the timing and the nature of fulfillment after 70 AD? Who failed to tell the next generation about the occurrence of the big three events? Why did they fail? How could they fail to teach the fulfillment if they were guided by the Holy Spirit into all the truth as Jesus had promised? Their silence after AD 70 raises the question whether they actually got what they were promised and what they expected. Hill points out the promise of the perfect in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 13, verse 12. Uh, he points out that Paul is talking about the, the perfect arriving at the parousia, that perfect condition or perfect status or perfect state of the church at that point. And he says, if the perfect indeed arrived in AD 70, and they now knew fully, and now saw face to face as they were expecting to, then how could they not have known that the perfect arrived, and that the big three events had occurred? You would think that at least one of them would have recognized the arrival of the perfect and reported it. Hill points out how utterly inconsistent it is to think that the very generation which attained the perfection of knowledge when the perfect came and saw that knowledge uh, and understood it, then they're the very generation that saw that knowledge evaporate virtually overnight after 70 AD. Hill says that this darkening of their understanding struck the church concurrently with the church's attainment of his ultimate state of perfection. How inconsistent can you get? I mean, you can't have it both ways, he says. How could the understanding of the church take such a nosedive at the very time it supposedly attained the consummation of its hope, its full measure of knowledge and sanctification, and its final state of conformity to the image of Christ. As he says, truly the irony and paradox here is astounding. He concludes by suggesting that if the preterist view was the true faith that was once for all delivered to the pre-70 saints, then every one of them who lived beyond 70 fumbled the faith away afterwards. The generation which experienced God's final perfecting of his saints is the very generation which let the faith slip right through its fingers. If Apostle John was still around after AD 70, as some fellow preterists think, why didn't he speak up and set the record straight? Surely he would have known that his book of Revelation had been fulfilled and that the Lord who promised to come shortly in his book had actually done so. Did John suddenly have a total loss of memory? Was an inspired apostle actually afraid to speak up for fear of rejection by his fellow Christians who were teaching a future return of Christ? And how could he be afraid to speak up after having been exiled for his testimony about Christ before the unbelieving and rejecting Jews. I mean, this, this doesn't sound uh, possible for someone who had already suffered persecution and rejection to not speak up for fear of rejection by his fellow Christians. Uh, this just is just unbelievable. How in the world John could sit there and hear those guys say that the parousia is still future, knowing that it had already occurred, is just beyond belief. How can this be? There's a serious historical problem here, which we preterists have been very, very slow and reluctant to deal with. We need to feel the weight of these historical arguments and answer them convincingly. It will not do to just sweep them under the carpet and ignore them or give them the quick brush off like so many of us have done in the past. We can do better than that. Our solution 
I believe, to these historical problems uh, will be twofold. Number one, uh, first, we will show that several of the Apostolic Father writings were actually written before AD 70, thus making them useless as futurist evidence against us. And this will widen the gap between the pre-70 writers and the first writings after AD 70. It creates a more extended period of silence than was recognized before uh, by preterist and futurist. But that only works for a handful of the earliest church father writings, those we know of as the uh, apostolic fathers. This still leaves another handful of early 2nd century writers uh, who we know definitely wrote after 70 AD. This is where the plot thickens and the full weight of Chuck Hill's arguments come to bear upon us preterists. This is where we have been weighed in the balance and found lacking in our response. Hill has shown exhaustively that there is no easy nor clear way uh, to explain the silence and confusion of these Christian writers after AD 70. If any of those pre-70 saints were still around on earth, their silence and confusion after experiencing the big three events is inexplicable. Why didn't even one of them speak up? and set the record straight when their post-70 brethren started saying that the big three eschatological events were still future. It does no good to argue, as some fellow preterists have, that most of the pre-70 saints were killed in the Neuronic persecution and therefore were not around after 87 to announce the fulfillment. That still means that some of them did survive the neuronic persecution. It doesn't matter if most of them were killed. Some of them still survived. And they should have spoke up and set the record straight. And by the way, we do know absolutely that some of the pre-70 saints did survive neuronic persecution and remained alive until the parousia because Jesus said so. In Matthew 16, 28, he says, Some of them standing here would not taste death until his return. And he said in Matthew 24 that the great tribulation would be cut short so that some of the saints would remain alive until his parousia. And so twice we have statements from Jesus himself saying that some saints would remain alive until the parousia. Now what happened to them at the parousia? Surely Jesus didn't kill them. At the parousia, they lived all that time, survived the neuronic persecution to remain alive until the parousia, and then they die? That doesn't make any sense. Uh, surely, if they lived to the parousia, they would have lived after it. And so, it accomplishes nothing against Chuck Hill's historical arguments to suggest that most of the pre-70 saints were not around after 70 A.D., we still have to explain why the few who did live and remain until the parousia did not speak up afterwards and set the record straight when their post-70 brethren started teaching that the big three events were still future. As we noted, this becomes a critical issue in the case of any of the apostles like John who may have remained on earth after the parousia. All Chuck Hill needs to clinch his argument is to prove that one single pre-70 saint actually lived through the parousia and remained alive on earth afterwards. If there was no rapture, then Chuck Hill has his proof. There would be some of those standing there who did, in fact, survive the neuronic persecution and remain alive until the parousia and would have been on earth afterwards to testify to what they saw and heard and experienced in the parousia at 70 AD. And so since they don't testify and they don't set the record straight, the only implication Chuck Hill can draw from that is that the parousia did not occur. Because if it occurred and they saw it and they heard it and experienced it, they would have said something about it and they would have set the record straight.
Chuck Hill admits, however, that the only easy way to solve this historical problem that preterists have is the one that J.S. Russell suggested in his Parousia book, and that is a rapture. Of course, Chuck Hill ridicules that idea as totally unacceptable, but it's interesting that he sees it as the only easy way to get around the problem of having post-70 Christians totally unaware of the occurrence of the big three eschatological events. All the Christians who knew about the Parousia were gone. The ignorance and confusion of the post-70 writers shows that they could not have been Christians at the time of the Parousia. They did not become Christians until later. They had no apostles or pre-70 saints still around to set the record straight and clear up their confusion. They remained unaware that the big three events had occurred. In order to confront Chuck Hill's arguments historically, uh, we're going to have to do a better job in the field of patristic studies. And that's where my uh, master's thesis is focused, where I redate the Epistle of Barnabas back before AD 70. That'll be the first step in showing that a lot of his arguments on these apostolic fathers simply don't hold water, and that they were actually pre-70 books. And that's why they talk about the second coming, the resurrection, and the judgment as being still future, because they were written before it happened, not after it happened. As we begin to get back into our historical chronological study, uh, we'll see how important Barnabas uh, was to the uh, first century church before 70 AD. There is a connection there, and, and the history of Barnabas and his epistle dovetails nicely into our study. His martyrdom on Cyprus in probably the year AD 60 or 61, somewhere in there, appears to have occurred about the same time Paul arrived in Rome for his first imprisonment there, in AD 60 or 61. The epistle of Barnabas had already been written before he was killed by the Jews on the island of Cyprus, and these events, I believe, will provide some additional pieces of the puzzle that we can use to reconstruct the dates of our New Testament books, as well as better understand their meaning for the first century saints, at least eschatologically. In our next study, uh, next time, we'll probably get back into this historical study and pick up where we left off previously at A.D. 62, while Paul was under house arrest in Rome. We need to keep in mind uh, the dates here and why they're significant. In 62 AD, when Paul was in Rome in prison, is just four years before the Jewish war with Rome began in AD 66. So we're just four years away from the outbreak of the Jewish war. And we're only two years away from the Neuronic persecution, which broke out in the summer of AD 64. Now, these are extremely important dates that we need to nail down in our mind uh, as we look at this history. Uh, from here on, we're going to be dealing with the Great Tribulation upon the Church, which is the Neuronic Persecution, and the outpouring of wrath upon her persecutors in 66 to 70 AD. Josephus calls this critical time of the destruction of Jerusalem the revolution of the ages, and what he means by that is the revolving or changing of the ages. Here he is, a, a Jewish a non-believer, he's not a Christian, Jewish historian, referring to the destruction of Jerusalem as the changing of the ages, the end of one age and the beginning of a new age. Very interesting. He doesn't realize just how much he's uh, giving credit to Jesus and the apostles by doing that. This is indeed the most critical part of our first century history that we've been dealing with. And I know all of you who are listening, who have been following our podcast on the other network, all of you are anxious to get into this final decade of history from 60 AD down to 70 AD. And we're really deep into it now. We're approaching the final hour. It is the last hour of the Old Testament age that's being wrapped up here 
and the new age is just about to begin. It's the most critical part of the history for us as preterists. This has been Then and Now with Ed Stevens. We would love to hear from you. Send your email to preterist1 at preterist.org. Our website has many great articles, books, and audio video resources. The address is www.preterist.org. This teaching ministry depends on your donations, and you share in all the good fruit that we produce. To make a donation or support monthly, simply go to our website, www.preterist.org, or call us at 814-368-6578. Join us again next time for Then and Now, where we study the past to shape a better future.